Um, and also, thank you for, to, for, the, um, circul the, for the papers that were circulated beforehand, which um, it's always, after, after re reading the papers, as is often the case, I feel I have a much clearer idea of what should be done. And I would have written rather a different paper had I think read, read all those beforehand. So what I'm going to do is going to depart from my title um, and I'm just going to pick out some parts of the paper that I think um, could be useful. I'm not going to talk so much about the conceptual problems, partly because um, other people here, yourself, Bitor, in, in, your, in your paper, and Jay Luis, in your paper, you deal with some of those conceptual problems far more better than I do. And so I'm not going to talk about those. I'm not going to discuss the metaphors of trade that I was thinking of discussing originally. Instead, what I'm going to do is to try to provide, a very, to start off with a very broad perspective by talking about the three examples that I discussed in the paper. And then I'm going to draw some conclusions. So the, the argument being that if we are to think about the role of Portugal in, sorry, that if we are to think about the transmission of ideas into and out of Portugal um, and how we think about that, we want to think about the larger context of the way ideas are flowing. And I have in the paper put down three examples and I may add to that a little bit, starting with the 18th century. Now, this may seem a long time from the 20th century, but I think it is still relevant. And I start with the 18th century, drawing heavily on a work that Terence Hutchison wrote in the 1980s, when he talked about what happened in the middle of the 18th century in France. He argued that there was an increase in the level of international con contacts centered on a single country. The pub there was a great publication of new journals, the establishment of new chairs in the subject, and crucially, the emergence of a body of internationally tradable ideas. It was a period, he argues, in which there was a convergence on certain fundamental ideas and a certain kind of systematization. Now, this is a description which, had I read it without having told you that he was talking about the 18th century, you would have just dozed off and thought, yes, he's talking about the world after 1945. But he is not. He is talking about the 18th century. And this, I think, draws attention to the fact that what's happening in the 20th century perhaps should be thought of in a longer context. These aren't, these, this internationalization that we see today is not unique. Well, it may have unique features, but it's not something that's never happened before. And I think having this broad perspective is, import, is important. And he is, in the 18th century, he is talking about a period, again, ideas which um, come up in the 20th century, there had been an increasing flow of international travel centered on Paris. So we think of an increasing flow of international travel today as airplanes become faster and cheaper and air travel becomes more, um, more widely available. There was no air travel in the 18th century, but in the 1860s there was nonetheless, sorry, in the 1760s, there was nonetheless an increase in travel, in particular to Paris. So we have a decade in which James Stewart, um, Galliani, Hume, Smith, Beccaria, Benjamin Franklin, all visited Paris. Now this may seem a small list of economists, <coughs> but to those um, working before, the fact of that there was travel at all was, was important. And there was also a convergence in what people were doing in their, in their political economy. So when we talk about 
the dominance of a sort of mainstream and convergence on the mainstream economics today. This has happened before, maybe not the, to the same extent. And perhaps thinking about this will help us think about the 20th century. The second episode is the late 19th century. And again, drawing on um, ideas of Terence Hutch Hutchison, um, in the late 19th century, Terence Hutchison argued there was a second truly international phase in the history of economics. Um, perhaps a little earlier than the 1890s, and I'm just wondering whether I may have made a typing error um, in, in, the written, in the written version. And one point he makes is that Vixel's value capital and rent and Pareto's cours um, do contain the author's original ideas, but he argues, and I'm quoting, they're constructed essentially on the basis of a wide, eclectic, cosmopolitan reading of their contemporaries and immediate predecessors. So we have a sort of internationalization in which um, Hutchison argues the preface to the second edition of Jevons theory of political economy was particularly important because what he is doing there is he is taking his own ideas in that book and he is locating them in an international context, in a cosmopolitan context, identifying predecessors to his action, to, 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 his, to his theories. Now, there are some things about this episode which, again, help us think about the 20th century, I suggest. Firstly, the mathematical nature of the new marginalist ideas on value of distribution, value and distribution, made them easier to transmit from one culture to another. And this is one of the issues about what happens in the sort of 20th century and also what conclusions we draw from it. Because on the one hand, we say, we might say, there are benefits from having greater international commun communication and from economics becoming more cosmopolitan. But on the other hand, we might say there are costs in that if only those ideas that can be reduced to this common currency, as it were, this, the math of mathematics are transmitted, then things are lost. And I will talk a little about that later on. So that is one difference in the 19th century example. And the second example is that the gradual professionalization of the discipline led to the subject being advanced by people who are under greater scholarly obligations than was felt by their less academic predecessors. So Jevons um, looking at the past to find antecedents of his own work reflected his being an academic that he felt an obligation to be scholarly in a way that people who were not academics did not. So in the 19th century, we find a few more ideas which I think are perhaps relevant. And then in the 19th century, Hutchison argues that eventually national traditions reasserted themselves. And he argues, um, with consider perhaps considerable embarrassment given what is going on today, um, especially in Britain, um, where the sort of British economists in particular isolated themselves from what was going on in the rest of Europe. There remained, he argues, deep philosophical and methodological differences, um, notably over ma the ma use of mathematics. And this was one reason why this sort of this move towards cosmopolitanism that we see in, in Jevons was not sustained. And also the influence of academic schools, which then were at their height and were largely national, was another factor in the um, growing sort of nationalization, sorry, nationalization is the wrong word, but you know what I mean, given our context of economics after this brief period when it became very cosmopolitan. So he, he, he writes, and I'm quoting again, these school systems rested on tenaciously maintained, if not always energetically explored, terminological dogmas, concepts, and philosophical presuppositions, which turned them into somewhat impermeable, monolithic, 
intellectual structures in the nature of ideologies insusceptible to modification or adjustment by piecemeal give and take of ideas, national or international. <clears throat> so he's saying the existence of these academic schools um, may be desirable in some ways had this consequence. So we have two episodes of internationalization before the one that really concerns us as the background to whatever was going on in Portugal in the, in the 1970s. And this is the internationalization of economics that's happened since um, 1945, where I'm drawing on work that other people in this room will be more familiar with or equally familiar with um, uh, the, um, than I am. Um, because it draw, I'm drawing heavily on the work of the late Bob Coates and the sort of projects that he organized. And what we have here is a process which can be seen perhaps as the transmission of a package of ideas and practices from the United States to a variety of other countries. And this involves not just um, the ideas, call it mainstream economics, whatever you want to call it, um, but a number of institutional changes. The increased importance of and changing character of graduate education, increased coursework and greater importance of the PhD in graduate training and changes in the nature of the PhD. You have the emergence of academic journals as the dominant vehicle for the publication of economic research, linked to the increased importance of journal articles as a criteria for appointment, appraisal, and promotion of academic staff, and a widely accepted hierarchy of journals. And the development of a more technical economics centered around a common core of neoclassical theory common to all the textbooks. Now, These changes are linked. The emergence of a more technical economics is linked to changes in graduate education. They're not completely in independent. They're, 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 they, go, they go along together. The emergence of academic journals is going to be, and their, their importance in promotion processes are linked to this more technical economics. So there are a number of issues to discuss here. One is, how do we regard this? Do we, and I talk in the paper about how we might regard it as homogenization, we might think about internationalization, or we might think about Americanization. And in the build up to the first um, part of this um, project, Bob Coates, I can remember discussions with Bob Coates where he were, and I imagine so Marco and others may have had similar discussions where he was agonizing over what he should call his project, Americanization or internationalization of economics. And there are problems here. For example, if you say it is a spread of American economics, the ideas did not all originate in the United States. If we take econometrics, a major part of modern economics, this has origins which are European as much as they are American. So what happens in the 1930s and onwards is the econometric ideas coming from people like Frisch in Norway um, and Tinbergen in the Netherlands become if they were ever completely separate, sort of merged with the more indigenous American um, mathematical traditions um, and statistical traditions um, found, in, found in the United States. So attaching a nationality to the ideas, tempting as it is, is very difficult. And the whole thing, of course, rests on ideas which were developed in the some of which were initially developed in the late 19th century in Europe. So attaching national labels is difficult. It is also, also becomes increasingly difficult even to identify the nationality 
of economists. OK, economists have a nationality printed in their passport, which is, but that is particularly pretty irrelevant. Um, when, for example, Joseph Stiglitz was working in Oxford, do we say Stiglitz is British economics and we are exporting Stig any ideas that Stiglitz um, produced when he was in Oxford to the rest of the world? This is crazy. Or take someone like Amartya Sen. Um, nationality does not... Well, for someone like Sen, his Indian background is crucial to understanding what he is doing. But given his mobility between Britain, the United States, and India, there is a sense in which nationality is the last thing you should, you should, be, you should be thinking about. So there are serious problems here. So what conclusions would I, would I draw? Well, the first one is that internationalization, I suggest, should not be thought of as a once and for all process. It is an ongoing process with many dimensions. For example, looking at the post-45 period, as I've said, in part we want to look at the ideas, but we also want to look at the processes underlying it. Um, but behind that, it is not just a once and for all thing that happens and then is done unless it is reversed. It is an ongoing process of interaction between different economists, which has many features, and I would suggest is probably multi-dimensional. The second point is that institutions matter. One point I've made is that internationalization, when it occurs, may not be sustained. And I think in the 18th century, the institutions for that were not, were not sustained. Um, we have, soon after the period that I mentioned, the political turmoil associated with the French Revolution and the Revolutionary Wars, and we have, which affects the relationship between economists in well, and, the, and American independence, affecting the relationship between economists in the United States, Britain, France, Ger Germany, and, and Italy. There are, there are not the institutions to sustain um, a cosmopolitan economics. In the 19th century, those institutions were there, but they were perhaps too weak to sustain it. Now, the institutions are different. So institutions matter, and I think this is, the, this is the second important point. A third point I'm going to make is that I'm going to suggest that details matter. And here, I felt when I was writing the notes on what I might say this morning, I'm, I was thinking so much about the other papers, I, my notes ended up being a commentary on other papers, many of which I really liked, liked reading, but because they provoked um, ideas in me. Um, details matter, and I would like to suggest we should be cautious in arguing in terms of very loosely defined, very broad terms. And rather than risk trying to discuss other papers inadvertently before the papers have been presented, I'll just talk about a couple of examples. Take, for example, Alfred Marshall and the spread of Marshallian ideas in American economics, something about which I've written with um, Steve Medimer and Bradley Bateman. You think of Marshall as um, a neoclassical economist. Maybe someone will want to challenge that, but then I think of something which, a, a question which resurfaced in a recent newspaper, as a recent newspaper headline, is the Pope a Catholic? If we deny that Alfred Marshall is a neoclassical e economist, I'm, I'm just not going down that route. I'm going to take it for granted that Marshall is a neoclassical economist. 
it's very easy then to jump to the conclusion that his appeal in the United States was because there were lots of neoclassical economists or lots of economists sympathetic to neoclassical economics in the United States and that's why they like Marshall but then when you look into the details you find no Marshall was a neoclassical economist but he was also engaging in thinking which was much more congenial to people who later became institutionalists um, <clears throat> whose thinking was very different. So his appeal in the United States was that he could be many different things to many different people. And I think this points out the importance of looking at details. Details matter who was picking up Marshall's ideas and what were they taking from Marshall. You could take things from Marshall other than the neoclassical optimization theory. So that is one example. Another example, and forgive me for mentioning the person whom I'm obsessed with for the past few years, Paul Samuelson. When you look especially at Paul Samuelson's early life, you find he is not a pure neoclassical economist. If he is a pure neoclassical economist, how come the first 200 pages of his textbook are about institutions? How come he is, using, he is immersing himself in data? And as you look carefully through his other publications, his formal research papers, you find he is a skeptic about most of the assumptions of economic theory. So, for example, talking about the Ramsey model, which we think of as core modern macroeconomics, a fanciful, fanciful conclusions based on fanciful assumptions. This is his assumption. Elsewhere, he, he is total skeptic about the idea that people engage in serious intertemporal optimization. And when you look at the details of what, of, of what he wrote, you find these things. He, he, when he, he talks about, well, we've, done, we've got this theory about how firms behave. Well, what's the real world like? And then he draws on things like markup pricing and oligopoly, and he sounds very much like a 1930s um, institutionalist. Now, why does this matter? Apart from the fact that I'm pushing a line on Samuelson. It matters because, and for, for the current project, in that one of the topics that's interesting is the international dissemination of Keynesian ideas. This is the context. He is, he is part of the context in which Keynesian ideas came into the, United, into the United States. He is one of those economists who was crucial in determining how Keynesianism changed when it entered the United States. And although you have people like Oscar Lange who were interpreting and Franco Modigliani, um, who were interpreting Keynes in different ways, Samuelson is also important. And he is incorporating Keynes into this um, framework, which is derived from institutionalism. So my general point here is details matter. Whether you're thinking about the reception of Marshall in the United States, whether you're thinking about the reception of Keynes by Samuelson and others in the, in the 1930s, details matter. And so when it comes to Portugal in the 1970s or whenever, as illustrated, I think, by some of the papers we're going to be hearing, I would suggest um, we have to think of it as an ongoing process, institutions matter, and the details, the fine detail, I suggest, is often going to matter. So those are the three maybe rather gen generic, bland conclusions, but they're the conclusions I'm going to draw from venturing rather more broadly into the history of internationalization. So I will stop there.